on this Saturday night, Tridemic Impact. Surging flu cases, along with RSV and COVID-19, caused closures and canceled surgeries at children's hospices and hospitals. This is all unprecedented in so many ways. Plastic pollution. As Canada prepares to ban some single-use plastics, world leaders meet to discuss a global strategy. Eruption disruption. The world's largest active volcano threatens Hawaii's highways. Plus, homegrown hip hop. From my light skin to blue eyes, my life's like a new tide. The medicine is inside. Meet the indigenous high school students behind this award-winning music video. Global National with Farhan Asser. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. If you and your family are canceling weekend plans due to illness, you're not alone. The respiratory virus season is hitting hard and fast this year. Hospitals across the country are struggling to cope with a combination of illnesses, including the seasonal flu. Alberta is one of the hardest hit regions in the country right now. Influenza cases there are spiking early and hitting levels not seen since 2009. That's the year the new H1N1 virus first emerged. As Marty Blunt reports, that's forcing medical workers to make some difficult decisions this weekend. People are out and about. Stores open for business and few masks in sight. Life is seemingly the closest to normal it's been in nearly three years. But this could be the calm before another storm, according to a new warning from the World Health Organization. Gaps in surveillance, testing, sequencing and vaccination are continuing to create the perfect conditions for a new variant of concern to emerge that could cause significant mortality. With unrestrained transmission, new variants can and will emerge. The warning comes as hospitals grapple with a so-called tridemic, seeing an influx of COVID-19, RSV and flu cases at once. Good. South of the border, the CDC is sounding the alarm over skyrocketing flu cases across the country. With nearly 20,000 people being admitted to hospital last week, almost double the number seen the week before. Here in Canada, many Many hospitals are already at a tipping point, dealing with overwhelmed emergency departments due to respiratory issues. In Alberta, health officials have been forced to temporarily pause respite services at Calgary's Rotary Flames House in order to redeploy staff to the Children's Hospital. It's quite sad that it has come to this. I think they're trying to minimize the impact on the rest of the patients as much as they can but it's now starting to have impact on patient care. In St. John's, the Children's Hospital is the latest to cancel surgeries and delay appointments due to a surge in patients. And officials at Winnipeg's HSC Children's are warning they could be in trouble if we don't slow the spread. Our season is gonna last longer. It's gonna peak higher. Um, and it's peaking and we're getting there fast. Epidemiologists say these are extraordinary measures. This is all unprecedented in so many ways. And every week there's a new unprecedented development in the realm of clinical care and in population health. Dio Nandan adds it is surprising that these are the drastic measures we have to take, given that there were signals months earlier that we would be in this level of crisis. He also says with hospitals strained and pandemic restrictions disappearing, curtailing this tridemic could once again boil down to individual choices. Jeff. Marnie Blunt in Ottawa. Thanks, Marnie. China is relaxing some of its strict COVID-19 measures this weekend after public frustration with its pandemic policies boiled over into unrest in recent weeks. <coughs> Long lines for COVID-19 tests were seen across Beijing today after China shut down many of its testing booths. Beijing has now removed negative test res re results as a condition to enter grocery stores. The same goes for subways in cities such as Shenzhen. China is set to announce further testing reductions in requirements despite daily case totals at near record highs. And some experts worry what the relaxing restrictions in such a large population could mean for the creation of COVID-19 variants. For example, if you had a huge population that had not been exposed previously and the virus takes off in that population, it's no longer immune escape that's conferring an advantage on, on different uh, versions of the virus. It's more like transmissibility, you know, ability to infect uh, on, a, on a larger scale. So if it were to tear through China, for example, where they don't have this background 
of past infection and they don't have the same uh, vaccination, uh, the same, uh, I would say, effectiveness of vaccination. And in any case, the vaccines generally don't stop transmission. They stop severe illness. Then you might get a really different direction of evolution from what we've seen in Western countries where there has been this background of a lot of infection. Turning to other news now, and a major change is coming soon to Canada's assisted dying laws, and it's already causing division among medical experts. Starting in March, it will be legal for people with mental health issues to receive medical assistance in dying. But some of Canada's top psychiatrists and families of patients are warning that will set a dangerous precedent. Global National's new Ottawa reporter, Taria Isri, has more. Psychiatrists are trained to deal with people in crisis. But some are now having their own crisis of confidence when it comes to medically assisted dying. Our role as therapists, as psychiatrists, is in suicide prevention. And so to ask us to then facilitate suicide is uh, very dissonant. The laws around medical assistance in dying or MAID are set to expand, including Canadians with mental illness. But medical experts across the country warn Canada's health care system is not ready. But we already know there is not really clear consensus on a definition of, for example, what it means for someone to have a mental illness that is incurable or irremediable. So we already know there's this risk of inconsistent application of MAID. When MAID became legal seven years ago, only patients with a terminal illness were eligible. In 2019, a Quebec judge ruled this restriction was unconstitutional, so Parliament amended the bill. In my view, mental illness is no different than any other medical illness. I believe that uh, doctors are quite capable of uh, assessing people with psychiatric illness and um, coming to the same uh, conclusions that they have for people who have uh, you know, cancer or uh, lung disease or uh, uh, neurological disorders. But families of patients worry there are not enough protections. We are so angry and insulted at how they just all turn their heads. Trisha Nichols told a parliamentary committee that her brother Alan was suicidal when he checked into the Chilliwack Hospital July 16th, 2019. Ten days later, he died with medical assistance. How can our government even be looking at expanding MAID laws? There are currently no laws protecting the vulnerable or their families from MAID. We understand that making sure we're respecting people's rights and their choices at the same time as we protect the most vulnerable is a very important but challenging balance to establish. Psychiatrists fear that balance will be even harder to strike with the health care system under immense pressure. Telling my patients that you will make it easier for them to die has enraged me. They will die because of lack of services. They will die because psychiatrists will now have legal permission to give up. The parliamentary committee studying the issue still has to release its final report. If Canada goes ahead with the amended legislation, we will have some of the most lenient assisted dying laws in the world. Taria Isri, Global News. Later this month, Canada will begin the process of banning some single-use plastics. And this week, global leaders met to negotiate a plan to specifically target plastic pollution across the planet. But their task is daunting. Plastics can be found in almost every aspect of our lives. And consumption continues to grow, despite the known threats to our environment and our health. Redmond Shannon reports. Even in the remote and seemingly pristine landscape of Antarctica, researchers have found microplastics in the water and ice. The microplastics that we found during this study were mostly microfibers. And these fibers um, come from all forms of textiles. Another new study in the North Atlantic shows a huge mix of plastics in some areas of the ocean, all coming from different parts of the world. We also find paint fragments. We find tire dust. Marine life ingests these broken down plastics and they make their way into our food chain. It reinforces this message of there being no silver bullet solution to tackle the plastics issue. On the mouth of the La Plata River in Uruguay, the next step toward a solution has begun. Government delegations meeting for the first of six summits to hammer out a legally binding treaty by 2024. 
Some of the measures being considered include a cap or even a ban on new plastic production, setting up a circular economy for reusing plastic items, restricting the export of plastic waste and removing harmful chemicals from plastics. It's estimated there are 10,000 types of chemical additives in different plastics. Over 2,500 are known to be toxic and harmful, uh, both to humans and um, uh, other organisms. Many scientists say a plastics treaty must hold countries to account, unlike the voluntary model of the Paris Agreement on climate change. We need a transformative shift. Uh, current uh, use and predicted increase in plastic uses is, is, is going to increase. And um, so we need strict binding agreements such as the Plastics Treaty. Canada is part of a so-called high ambition coalition pushing for a legally binding treaty. Notably, the group doesn't include major plastic producers like the US and China. Meanwhile, Canada's ban on some single-use plastic items like cutlery, bags and straws begins its three-year rollout on December 20th. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And a little later in the newscast, we'll look at the growing costs of climate change and how some Canadian communities are trying to adapt. To Hawaii now, where thousands of people on the Big Island are enjoying a view that's both beautiful and dangerous. The eruption of the world's largest active volcano. The lava flowing from Mauna Loa is now making transportation officials nervous. As Jennifer Johnson reports, the volcano is threatening the island's main highway. The eruption of Mauna Loa, her first in 38 years, is majestic and spiritual for many Hawaiians. I saw the 1984 Mauna Loa and I followed the Pu'u O eruptions. It's like the goddess returns. For now, that's true. Homes and neighborhoods have been spared. But the volcano's slow moving lava is edging closer to the Big Island's main transportation route, the DKI Highway. It's very high probability that this lava flow, if it continues, will definitely reach the road. So we're looking at about two days out. Hawaii County's Civil Defense Agency says if lava flows onto the highway, residents, tourists and delivery trucks will be forced to travel along coastal roads, taking hours longer to get to the island's main cities. And the agency predicts it will take the federal government months to get the highway passable again. Another eruption could threaten neighborhoods, something thousands of residents fear. About 700 homes were destroyed in the 2018 Kilauea eruption. It was a rough time, you know, it was uh, as spectacular and as beautiful as, as, you know, these eruptions can be. It's, it's very difficult when it uh, impacts communities and families. For now, all that scientists and government officials can do is watch and wait. Schools and businesses near the volcano remain open. Cars are still moving on the DKI highway. But the lava's path, a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle that has attracted thousands of tourists, is threatening to change all that. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Unprecedented provincial powers. Coming up, the Alberta Premier's proposed changes to her controversial Sovereignty Act. Plus, sending reinforcements why these Canadian soldiers are heading to Europe. More than 100 Canadian Armed Forces personnel left Alberta for Latvia today, joining a multinational battle group that's part of NATO's Operation Reassurance. The aim of the mission is to relieve existing Canadian troops there from Manitoba and reinforce the treaty's collective defences in the face of growing Russian aggression. The Canadian contingent will work directly with the Latvian army for the next six months to train and strengthen Europe's eastern flank. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith fulfilled a campaign promise this week to introduce the Alberta Sovereignty Act. Smith says the act is designed to protect Alberta's interests, allowing the provincial government to ignore federal laws that it deems harmful to Alberta. It would also allow Smith and her cabinet to rewrite bills unilaterally, sparking criticism from some calling the act unconstitutional and undemocratic. Well, this week on the West Block, our Mercedes Stevenson takes a closer look at the move in an interview with the Premier. Jeff, Premier Danielle Smith says the act isn't designed to override the Alberta legislature, nor meant as a power grab. Both criticisms leveled at her after the bill was tabled. Smith says she recognizes the concerns people have about how the bill has been written and is open to changing it. I understand there's a problem. 
with uh, one of the clauses. People have raised some concerns about us. We're taking a look at that. If we need to tidy a few things up, then we'll do that. Because the intention has always been to make sure that the that anything that we do, any action that we take, has been fully debated by those who are represented to, uh, to, to represent the interests of the people of Alberta. The potential mid-course change raises questions about why the Smith government tabled a bill with such an unprecedented power in the first place. The bill also empowers Alberta to ignore federal legislation it deems harmful to Alberta's interests. I asked the Premier if she has a specific target in mind for when she might use it first, and she identified two possibilities, the oil and gas sector emissions cap or the fertilizer cap for farmers being introduced by Ottawa. One thing is clear, the bill is aimed at putting the onus and target on Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government in Ottawa, whether that's through the letter or spirit of the Sovereignty Act. I think we've tried to be a constructive partner in Confederation, and it hasn't worked. So we've got to try something different, and that's what this Sovereignty Act is all about. Smith says she believes the bill is already doing its critical job, sending a message to Ottawa, and the Premier will tell us what evidence she thinks she has that the federal government may be softening on some positions. We'll talk about all that and whether the bill is a necessary strategy or political theatre. Plus, we'll sit down with the former Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, on why he thinks the international community needs to abandon hopes of diplomacy with Russia to end the war in Ukraine. Jeff? Thanks, Mercedes. And you can watch the full interview with the Alberta Premier tomorrow morning on the West Block, right here on Global. Still ahead, how Canadian communities are adapting to climate change. Some spectacular views high above Earth today as two NASA astronauts geared up for a seven-hour spacewalk on the International Space Station. Among the meticulous maintenance they're performing in zero gravity, the main goal is to install a brand new solar array. That's expected to significantly boost the station's electric power, which will be a big help to operations and research on board. Back down here on Earth, the effects of climate change are being felt with greater frequency and severity. And there's growing recognition that the world needs to do more to prepare for extreme weather events. Kamyar Razavi reports on how some Canadian communities are adapting. This is what the city of Peterborough, two hours east of Toronto, looked like in July 2004. 150 millimeters of rain falling on the community in one hour. It was obviously one of the worst floods that uh, we've seen in the city. Since then, the city has been working hard to upgrade its infrastructure and to adapt to extreme weather, a task that's become more urgent and immediate across the country as climate change fuels extreme weather. <laughs> now in BC's Fraser Valley, farms, even the highway, completely submerged last year in devastating flooding. This is about helping the country adapt to the new reality of climate change. Last week, Bill Blair, Canada's emergency preparedness minister, announced $1.6 in new spending for adaptation measures. In Peterborough, that work had long begun before the federal announcement. They're working with a mapping company called Ecopia AI to help planners make predictions of where the water will go in case of flooding. Every single sewer, storm drain, every single catch basin, water course, um, everything in the city. It's a high-tech response to an age-old problem, emphasizing what climate adaptation experts say is the need to be prepared ahead of time. You know, it's very clear at this point that like the, the impacts of climate change um, are very costly compared with you know what it would take to avoid them. And more municipalities are taking this seriously, not just because they have to, but because they want to. In the future, we're going to be looking at municipalities who um, are recognized for being climate resilient and their property values are going to go up because people are going to want to live there. Adapting to the reality of a dangerously warming planet. Kamya Razavi, Global News. Up next, high school musical. The students and the story behind this new music video. Welcome back. A group of Indigenous students in Chateau Gay, Quebec, are making waves with a new music video. Their original song premiered this week at their Howard S. Billings High School. As Gloria Enriquez explains, the video hopes to inspire others about the importance of reconnecting with their Indigenous roots. The 
video could belong in any international music channel and the artist signed to any famous record label. But this talented bunch isn't too far to reach. They can be easily found hanging out in the halls of the Howard S. Billings High School. It's not like me to be so out there. I'm not very outgoing, so being able to um, like be out there was pretty awesome. Will the four of you please come up to the stage? The now local stars responded to a call out at school for Indigenous students to create a music video. The project is part of the Nui Jinan program for Indigenous youth to share their voices and talents. They show that we're here, you know. They worked for five days. The lyrics all about their high school experience and what it is like to be an Indigenous youth. From my light skin to blue eyes, my life's like a new tide. The medicine is inside, I can never lose pride. From the judgment they can experience for the way they look. The ground is breaking and I'm falling through. Feeling judged by the things I do. To the prejudice and false preconceptions some have about people living in a reserve. This like proves people that like that stigma like isn't true at all and that like native people like can accomplish like big things. The video premiered in front of their whole school. We were all super nervous, you know, just trying to cover each other because it was just like super nerve wracking, you know. But they conquered their fears Take it down. and proved that together. No need to worry about it. Now I feel so free because I got me and I got you. They can overcome anything, and most importantly, they have the power to write their own story. Oh, I was drowning, now we standing tall. Gloria Enriquez, Global News, Chattagay. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight, your Canada is the lights at Lafarge Lake display in Coquitlam, British Columbia. We love seeing your Canada, so please send us your holiday-themed photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.